Welcome to a research to practice video providing design guidance for the hydraulic conductivity of soil bentonite slurry trench cutoff walls. This video was prepared as part of an initiative of the Geoenvironmental Engineering Technical Committee of ASCE's Geo Institute. I'm Jeff Evans, Professor Emeritus, Bucknell University. So let's begin with a description of a soil bentonite slurry trench cutoff wall. This is a vertical barrier installed in the subsurface to prevent horizontal groundwater flow and contaminant migration. It's a two-part construction process where first the trench is excavated under a head of bentonite water slurry and then that slurry is displaced with the backfill. So as you can see in the photograph on the left, if you attempt to excavate a trench in sand, it slopes and you have a very wide excavation. Whereas on the right of this photo, if you excavate under the head of a bentonite water slurry, the trench walls are essentially vertical and in theory there's no limitation on the depth to which you can excavate. Once the trench is excavated and slurry filled, the slurry needs to be displaced with the backfill. Make it, make it flow a little easier. Here's a schematic of the backfill placement showing how the backfill just slides down the trench um, and displaces the bentonite water slurry in front of it. The best mixture to make this backfill is a base soil that is well graded, consisting of gravel, sand, and silt sized particles, as well as clay sized particles. You can see in the schematic on the right side of this image the larger particles come together, make contact, but tend to leave larger voids between them. These voids then are progressively filled by smaller and smaller particles in this well-graded base soil uh, grain size distribution. Bentonite water slurry is added to, to make the material have a slump from three to six inches so it flows easily in the trench. It turns out the hydraulic conductivity of this material is not a single value, but rather is stress dependent. As you can see from this slide, the hydraulic conductivity of a soil bentonite backfill taken from a construction site in Birdsboro, Pennsylvania, decreases over two orders of magnitude as the stress increases over the testing range. Secondly, you can see on the slide, the error bars denote there is considerably more variability in the hydraulic conductivity at low effective stresses. Not all materials are as stress dependent as the Birdsboro site. Uh, here's a intermediate fine soil uh, and the decrease in hydraulic conductivity over the stress range tested is about a half to one orders of magnitude depending upon the dry bentonite content. This slide also shows that if you add additional dry bentonite, the hydraulic conductivity will decrease. Note that by just adding slurry to get the material to a proper slump, uh, the mixture will have about 1% bentonite. So what is the hydraulic, what is the effect of stress in the trench so we know what hydraulic conductivity we could possibly expect? Well, it was long recognized that when you put a soft compressible material into a rigid trench, it's going to want to settle, it's going to consolidate, there's going to be friction along the sidewalls, and the stresses within that backfill are going to be less than those stresses calculated using the geostatic state of stress. In fact, this model is called arching, and it's the same model Terzaghi used to predict the forces on a buried pipe. This could be was later quantified, as you can see here on the drawing, as the arching model, and it shows very, very low stresses in the trench. However, that model also assumes rigid sidewalls, and Professor Phils from Virginia Tech recognized that the sidewalls move in, causing lateral squeezing of the backfill. Daniel Ruffing at Bucknell University modified that model to incorporate the 
compressibility characteristics of the back tail into the modified lateral squeezing model. And that's shown here for both the mean lateral squeezing as well as a range of compressibilities for backfill. Finally, the geostatic is shown, and as you can see, it's much higher than the lateral. Of course, all of these are simply models, calculations of what we think might occur. So with the help of funding from NSF, a slurry trench cutoff wall was built and instrumented to measure the in-situ stress. These data show the stress measured in three dimensions at three different depths in this slurry trench cutoff wall. Note firstly that the transverse stress is much higher than the vertical or longitudinal stress, and that's to be expected because the sidewalls are moving in, squeezing the backfill. The lowest of the three stresses is the vertical stress, and the longitudinal is the intermediate stress of these three. It turns out the transverse is also the major principal stress, the vertical is the minor principal stress. You can also see something funky occurring near the bottom, and that's because the trench is constrained at the bottom and can't move in as freely as it can higher up in the trench. Lastly, you can observe that all the stress values are very low, somewhere between 5 and 15 or 16 kilopascals. Well, let's combine all of these models that we've already discussed with a couple of others and see what the trend looks like. We can see that um, the model previously discussed, the real data just discussed, and stresses calculated using the inclinometers that were installed on the NSF project, as well as the stresses predicted from PECS, earth pressure diagram developed for braced excavations in sand, all shown on this one figure and all in a very tight pattern of stresses ranging from up to 20 or 21 kilopascals at a depth of 7 meters. You'll note also that the geostatic vertical stress is very, very high, peaks at 90 kilopascals at 7 meters, but using the active earth pressure coefficient is also a reasonable prediction of the, of the stress. So taking all this together, we can see that the stresses are very, very low, they're not geostatic, and there's a pretty tight bandwidth of results uh, for any of, any of the methods. So in summary, we know that well-graded uh, soils consisting of gravel, sand, silt, and clay are the ideal soils to make soil bentonite backfill. These well-graded soils reduce compressibility and hydraulic conductivity as compared to other more uniform grain size distributions. We also have learned that the hydraulic conductivity is of the soil bentonite backfill is stress dependent, and the magnitude of that dependency depends upon the grain size distribution, the bentonite content, and the water content of the backfill. Higher fines content, higher bentonite contents, higher water contents all increase the stress dependency. As the stress increases, the hydraulic conductivity decreases. Conducting hydraulic conductivity tests at geostatic stresses can lead to a serious underestimation of the hydraulic conductivity of the soil bentonite backfill in the field. Finally, in the absence of site-specific earth pressure information, the lateral squeezing model is recommended to determine the earth pressure for the design of the laboratory test program to measure hydraulic conductivity. This slide presents the references cited um, in the figures above. And more information on this work can be found both in the citations at the end of the presentation, as well as by inquiries to me at evans at bucknell.edu. Additional research to practice videos can also be found at the Geoenvironmental Technical Committee website at the uh, link shown in this presentation. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.